Excerpts from the Jungle by Upton Sinclair with photos by Aurora Drake. Hi, I like potatoes. I like potatoes when they are baked. Okay. Let a man so much as scrape his finger pushing a truck in the pickle rooms, and he might have a sore that would put him out of the world. Not yet. All the joints in his fingers might be eaten by the acid, one by one. Of the butchers and floorsmen, the beef boners and trimmers, and all those who use knives, you could scarcely find a person who had the use of his thumb. Time and time again, the base of it had been slashed, till it were a mere lump of flesh against which the man pressed the knife to hold it. The hands of these men would be crisscrossed with cuts until you could no longer pretend to count them or to trace them. They would have no nails. They had worn them off pulling hides. Their knuckles were swollen so that their fingers spread out like a fan. There were men who worked in the cooking rooms in the midst of steam and sickening odors by artificial light. In these rooms, the germs of tuberculosis might live for two years, but the supply was renewed every hour. There were the beef luggers, this one? Mm -hmm. put, it, put it right in front, who carried 200 pound quarters into the refrigerator cars, a fearful kind of work that began at four o'clock in the morning and that wore out the most powerful men in a few years. There were those who worked in the chilling rooms and whose special disease was rheumatism. The time limit that a man could work in the chilling rooms was said to be five years. Now the hands. There were the wool pluckers, whose hands went to pieces even sooner than the hands of the pickle men, for the pelts of the sheep had to be painted with acid to loosen the wool, and then the pluckers had to pull out this wool with their bare hands, till the acid had eaten their fingers off. There were those who made the tins for the canned meat, and their hands, too, were a maze of cuts, and each cut represented a chance for blood poisoning. Some worked at the stamping machines, and it was very seldom that one could work long there at the pace that was set and not give out and forget himself and have a part of his hand chopped off. <gasps> there were the hoisters, as they were called, whose task it was to press the lever which lifted the dead cattle off the floor. They ran upon a rafter, peering down through the damp and the steam. And as old Durham's architects had not built the killing room for the convenience of the hoisters, but every few feet there would have they would have to stoop under a beam. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Say four feet above the one they were on, which got them into the habit of stooping, so that in a few years they would be walking like chimpanzees. Worst of any, however, were the fertilizer men and those who served in the cooking rooms. These people could not be shown to the visitor, for the odor of a fertilizer man would scare any ordinary visitor at a hundred yards. And as for the other men who worked in tank rooms full of steam, and in some of which they were open vats near the level of the f level of the floor, mm -hmm. their peculiar trouble was that they fell into the vats, and when they were fished out, there was never enough of them left to be worth exhibiting. Sometimes they would be overlooked for days, till all but the bones of them had gone out into the world as Durham's pure leaf lard. There was meat that was taken out of pickle and would often be found sour, and would rub it with soda to take away the smell, and sell it to be eaten on free lunch counters. Also, of all the miracles of chemistry which they performed, given to any sort of meat, fresh or salted, whole or chopped, any color and any flavor and any odor they chose. In the pickling of hams, they had an ingenious... An ingenious... You gotta wait a while. Oh, come on. apparatus by which they save time and increase the capacity of the plant. A machine consisting of a hollow needle attached to a pump. By plunging this needle into the meat and working with his foot, a man could fill a ham with a pickle in a few seconds. And yet, in spite of this, there would be hams found spoiled. Some of them with an odor so bad that a man could hardly bear to be in the room with them. To pump into these packers had a second and much stronger pickle which destroyed the odor a process known to the workers as giving them 30%. Also, after the hams had been smoked, they would be found some that had gone to the bad. Formerly, these had been sold as number three grade. But they later on, some ingenious person had hit upon 
a new device. This one? No. And now they would extract the bone, about which the bad part generally lay, and insert in the hole a white hot iron. After this invention, there was no longer number one, number two, or number three grade. There was only number one grade. The Packers were always or originating such schemes. They had what they called boneless hams, which were all the odds and ends of pork stuffed into casings, and California hams, which were the shoulders with big knuckle joints and nearly all the meat cut out, and fancy skinned hams, which were made of the oldest hogs, whose skins were so heavy and coarse that no one would buy them. That is, until they had been cooked and chopped fine and labeled head cheese. Cut up by 2,000 revolutions, a minute flyers, and mixed with half a dozen of other meat, no odor that was ever in a ham could make any difference. There was never the least attention paid to what was cut up for sausage. They would come all the way back from Europe. Old sausage that had been rejected and that was moldy and white would be doused with borax and glycerin and dumped into the hoppers and made over again for some consumption. There would be meat that had tumbled out on the floor in the dirt and sawdust where the workers had tramped and spit upon billions of consumption germs. There would be meat stored in great piles and rooms, and the water from leaky roofs would drip over it, and thousands of rats would race about on it. It was too dark in these storage places to see well, but a man could run his hand over these piles of meat and sweep off handfuls of the dry dung of rats. These rats were nuisances, and the packers would put poisoned bread out for them. They would die, and then rats, bread, and meat would go into the hoppers together. This is no fairy story, and no joke. The meat would be shoveled into carts, and the man who did the shoveling would not trouble to lift out a rat, even when he saw one. There were things that went into the sausage in comparison with which a poisoned rat was a tidbit. There was no place for the men to wash their hands before they ate their dinner, and so they made a practice of washing them in the water that was to be ladled into the sausage. There were the butt ends of smoked meat and the scraps of corned beef and all the odds and ends of the waste of the plants that would be dumped into old barrels in the cellar and left there under the system of rigid economy, which the packers enforced. There were some jobs that it only paid once to do in a long time. And among them, was the cleaning out of these waste barrels. Every spring they did it, and in the barrels would be dirt and rust and old nails and stale water. And cartload after cartload of it would be taken up and dumped into the hoppers with the fresh meat. And sent out to the public's breakfast. Some of it would be made into smoked sausage but as the smoking took time and was therefore expensive, they would call upon their chemistry department and preserve it with porac, borax and color it with gelatin to make it brown. All of their sausage came out of the same bowl, but when they came to wrap it, they would stamp some of it general. And for this, they would charge two cents more a pound. That's why their motto was everything but the squeal. I like baked potatoes and donuts and candy.